Picture yourself in a bustling cafe in Moscow, somewhere in the 1930s. Everyone's chatting, sipping coffee, living their everyday lives. Then, in walks this mysterious gentleman, and strange things begin to happen. A wallet vanishes, then reappears. A man turns into a pig. The city is abuzz with rumors. Is he a magician? A madman? Or, as some whisper, the devil himself? Now, this chaos is just the backdrop for an even bigger story. There's also a writer in despair, struggling with his work about Pontius Pilate, and he's in love with this woman, Margarita. She's bold, brave, and ready to do anything for her love. But their love is not a simple affair. It's tangled up with this otherworldly chaos happening in Moscow. This, my friend, is where The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov starts. It's a book that dives into this whole crazy scenario. It's got everything. Romance, satire, a bit of the supernatural, and a lot of questions about life, power, and what's really true. Bulgakov wrote this during a pretty tough time in Soviet history, but he did it with such wit and imagination. It's like playing a game of cat and mouse with the authorities. This novel is leaping into other forms of media, films, TV shows, even ballet and music. The 1968 song Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones was inspired by this very novel. So why should you pick up this book? Because it's a journey into a world where anything can happen. One minute, you're laughing and the next, you're deep in thought. It's a story that shows how life, love, and art can all mix together, sometimes in the most unexpected ways. And you know what? It's not just a book. It's a whole experience waiting to happen. The Master and Margarita has two main places where all the action happens. First up, we've got Moscow in the 1930s. That's where Satan pops up. But he's going around as this guy named Professor Wallen. He's not alone, though. He's got this wild crew with him. There's Koroviv, who's dressed in a really out there way, kind of like a valet. And then there's Behemoth, who's not your average pet. He's a talking black cat. Azazello's part of a gang too. He's like a hitman. And don't forget Hela. She's a vampire. This gang, they've got a thing for messing with the literary big shots in Moscow, especially the people at Maselin. That's like their club or trade union. And their hangout is the Griboyadov house. The people in Maselit? Well, they're not exactly the best bunch. Lots of corrupt types. People climbing the social ladder any way they can and a bunch of cynics. The other setting is a long, long way back in time. We're talking about Jerusalem when Pontius Pilate was found. This part of the story gets into the trial of Yeshua ha Nazri, part one. All right, let's start from the first part of the novel, which starts off in Moscow around 1030s at Patriarch's Pond. A rather ordinary setting is about to become the backdrop for an extraordinary encounter. Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz the big boss of Masolit, a prestigious literary organization, and Ivan Nikolaevich Ponirev, a young and fiery poet known by his pen name, Bezdomny, are about to experience something that will turn their world upside down. Then, Professor Wallen are introduced. He's Satan in disguise. The air is thick with a sense of unease as Wallen engages Berlioz and Ivan in conversation. Out of the blue, he drops a chilling prophecy. Berlioz will meet his end that very night. Imagine the shock. Berlioz tries to brush it off, but there's a nagging feeling that this isn't just a random prediction. Now, the story takes a leap back in time, all the way to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. We're thrown into the midst of Pontius Pilate's trial of Yeshua HaNotri, known to us as Jesus of Nazareth. This storyline serves as a fascinating counterpoint to the events unfolding in Moscow, adding layers of complexity to the narrative. Pilate, the Roman governor, is depicted as a man torn between his duty and conscience, wrestling with the fate of Yeshua. Back in Moscow, Wollin's bizarre entourage starts to stir things up. Berlioz exits the park, ignoring the discourse of a somewhat insolent vagabond, Korovev. However, upon reaching the gates, he encounters death exactly as described by Wollin. These tragic events unfold before the eyes of a shocked and desperate Ivan, who will try to capture the gang and inform everyone of their magical powers. But instead, he will be interned into a mental institution, deemed schizophrenic. In his room at the psychiatric hospital, Ivan receives a visit from another patient, a writer driven to despair by the rejection from the Soviet literary critic's taste towards his novel about Pontius Pilate. He calls himself the Master. While recounting his story, the Master recalls his personal descent into madness, remembering how love had suddenly struck him one spring day, the secret meetings in his basement with a married woman, the final drafting of the novel, the criticism accusing him of wanting to introduce an apology for Jesus Christ into the press, the nightmares, and finally, the decision to set his work on fire. He now lives in the hospital in a state of total detachment from the real world, 
While listening to Ivan's incredible tale and surprised to hear the name Pontius Pilate, he reveals to the poet that Professor Wallen is none other than Satan. Meanwhile, Wallen and his gang have deceitfully taken over Berlioz's apartment, while the other tenant in the house, Stepan Bogdanovich Lichodiv, the director of the Moscow Variety Theater, after hiring Wallen for a black magic show, is instantly sent with Azezolo's spell to Yalta on the Black Sea. The narrative is laced with satirical depictions of Masolitz, Griboyedov House, and the Soviet elites. The magic show at a variety theater becomes the stage for one of the most surreal and mind-bending sequences. Bengalski, the show's host, experiences the horror and wonder of having his head temporarily removed and then reattached, leaving the audience in a state of shock and awe. Koroviv amazes the spectators by making money rain from the ceiling, and Wallen's group lavishly distributes luxurious fashion items to the women in the audience. But then the gifts vanish, leading to widespread embarrassment and chaos, symbolizing the fickle nature of wealth and the superficiality of societal values. Bulkakov uses this scene to critique Soviet society, emphasizing the vanity, greed, and susceptibility to temptation of the new elite. Wolin's observations about Muscovite's love for money, despite technological advancements like buses, telephones, and other apparatuses, highlight the unchanged, fundamental nature of people. Now, in between this chaos, Ivan is haunted by a dreamlike vision of Yeshua's execution, witnessed through the eyes of Matthew Levi. Levi, in a desperate bid to spare Yeshua from a painful death, plans to swiftly end his life, but it's too late. Yeshua's prolonged suffering on the cross, culminating in a merciful act by an executioner, is depicted with harrowing detail, emphasizing the cruelty and inhumanity of his execution. The aftermath of Wolin's performance plunges Moscow into a surreal state of confusion. Vasily Stepanovich, the bookkeeper of the Variety Theater, is left to make sense of the chaotic aftermath. He encounters a bizarre landscape where money turns into insects, bureaucrats are transformed into animated suits, and offices are cursed with involuntary singing. The uncle of Berlioz, attempting to claim his late nephew's apartment, faces a bizarre and violent eviction at the hands of Behemoth and Azazel. In a twist of fates, Andrei Sokov, the barman at the Variety Theater, encounters Woland in the apartment. Woland reveals to Sokov his impending death from liver cancer suggesting he indulge in a life of hedonism with the little time he has left. The first part of The Master and Margarita sets the stage for an enthralling narrative that masterfully blends the real with the surreal. Bulgakov's portrayal of Moscow under the influence of Walland and his retinue offers a scathing critique of Soviet society, exposing its moral decay and the emptiness behind its facade of progress. The novel's opening chapters lay the groundwork for a complex story that continues to unravel in unexpected and thought-provoking ways. Part 2 Part 2 of the book introduces us to one of the most enchanting and pivotal characters in the novel, Margarita, the devoted lover of the master, whose fate is intertwined with his and the bizarre occurrences in Moscow. Margarita refuses to give in to despair over her lover and his work, holding on to hope against all odds. Her journey takes a fantastical turn when Azazelo, a member of Woland's entourage, gives her a magical skin ointment and extends an invitation to her to attend the Devil's Midnight Good Friday Ball. This invitation marks the beginning of Margarita's transformation into a witch, opening up a world of possibilities and dark enchantments. As Margarita enters the realm of the night, she discovers her newfound ability to fly and control her unleashed passions. Accompanied by Natasha, her maid, Margarita soars over the Soviet Union's deep forests and rivers in a surreal journey of liberation and discovery. This flight is not just a physical journey, but also a metaphorical one, representing Margarita's escape from the constraints of her mundane life. Upon bathing and returning to Moscow with Azazolo, Margarita finds herself assuming the role of the hostess of Satan's Spring Ball. At the side of Koroviv, another of Wallant's associates, she greets dark historical figures as they emerge from hell and enter the ball. This event is a gathering of the damned, a night of decadence and supernatural occurrences that test Margarita's resolve and strength. Margarita endures this ordeal with remarkable resilience. Recognizing her courage and steadfastness, Satan offers to grant her deepest wish. Instead of asking for something for herself, Margarita chooses to free a woman she met at the ball from eternal punishment. This woman's tragic story, she was raped and in her despair, murdered her child, waking each morning to the haunting memory embodied in the handkerchief she used to smother her child, moves Margarita deeply. Satan acknowledges Margarita's selfless wish and informs her that the woman has been liberated. Furthermore, 
Margarita is told that she still has another wish she can claim from him. Without hesitation, Margarita's second wish is for the Master to be reunited with her. The Master, bewildered and believing he is still in the lunatic asylum, appears before her. The couple is then magically transported back to the basement apartments that once served as their sanctuary of love. The narrative takes a poignant turn when Matthew Levi, one of Wolin's company, delivers a verdict. The reunited couple will be sent to the afterlife. In a symbolic gesture, Zazalo brings them a gift from Wolin, a bottle of Pontius Pilate's poisoned wine. The Master and Margarita drink the wine, leading to their deaths. Zazalo then escorts their souls to join Satan and his retinue, who are waiting on horseback on a Moscow rooftop. As they fly away into the unknown, the city's cupolas and windows burn in the setting sun marking their departure from Earth and their journey into the vastness of cosmic space. The afterlife for the Master and Margarita is depicted as a serene and idyllic place, resembling the limbo described by Dante Alighieri, a region under flowing cherry trees, where they will spend eternity together in peace and tranquility. As the narrative nears its conclusion, Wallen and his retinue, including the Master and Margarita, transform into pure spirits. In the aftermath of the bizarre events that have unfolded in Moscow, the city's authorities attribute the strange occurrences to hysteria and mass hypnosis. Unable to comprehend or accept this supernatural reality, in the final chapter, a significant moment occurs when Wallen instructs the master to complete his novel about Pontius Pilate, a character who has been condemned to limbo for eternity due to his cowardice. The master, empowered by Wallen's command, liberates Pontius Pilate, shouting, you are free! He is waiting for you! This act allows Pilate to finally walk and talk with Yeshua, whose spirit and philosophy he had secretly admired. The novel concludes with Moscow returning to a state of peace, though some residents feel a sense of disquiet every May full moon, a reminder of the surreal events that transpired. Ivan Ponirev, deeply impacted by his experiences, becomes a professor of philosophy but abandons his poetry, signaling a transformation in his character and outlook on life. As the wild and magical events of the novel begin to quiet down, we reach the part where everything comes together, where the chaos starts to make sense. Margarita's brave journey through the night and her dedication to the master, her true love, lead to a moment of kindness from the least expected place. Wallens, the mysterious stranger who is really the devil in disguise. The master, who has been suffering, finds peace at last. Wallen sees the pure love Margarita has for the master and decides to do something good for them. In a surprising turn, he gives them a gift. A quiet place where they can be together, away from the noise and pain of the world. It's like they have been given a second chance, a new life where they can find happiness. This gentle ending is Bulgakov's way of showing us that even in a story full of strange and sometimes scary events, love is the strongest force. It's love that gets the final word a love so deep that it changes the hearts of the most powerful being in the story. The Master and Margarita are given a peaceful end to their story, a reward for their true and loyal love. The Master and Margarita leaves us pondering the complexities of faith, power, and the human condition. It challenges us to question the reality we accept and the morals we uphold. Bulgakov's narrative is not merely a story, but a mosaic of human experiences, a labyrinth where every corner turned reveals deeper truths about ourselves and the society we live in.